Thank you, Judge. Appreciate it. Yes, take your Bibles and turn with us to the book of Ephesians, chapter number 6. We're going to be looking at verses 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9 in a message entitled, Faith at Work. What is your least favorite job of all time? I sent you that in a text Monday, and here's some of your responses. Some are related to uh, employment. Some are related to just day-to-day chores. So here we go. Telemarketing was among the least favorite. One said it was awful. I took a bathroom break and never went back. Filing and data entry was terrible, according to some. Collection agency, retail, customer service, working at Blockbuster. Some of you don't even know what that is. Selling balloons at Disneyland at park closing time. And and all of these had and doing the laundry. As cleaning manure from the stable and spreading in the field, sanitation, those kind of things. Picking shelling peas, shucking corn, mopping, ironing, cooking, dishwashing, painting, mowing. Working in my dad's tobacco field. Working at a government agency. Dissembling a roller coaster at, at county fair. Homicide cleanups, that's an interesting one. One said a drink cart girl at Chattanooga Golf and Country Club thought I could earn good tips. They never tipped. That's why they're all so rich. And she added laundry. No, I'm just kidding. Work is a gift from God, but some jobs are more desirable than others. Some may be less desirable than others. But it's not what you do that makes what you do sacred. It's why you do what you do. What is your why? What is the why that gets you up in the morning? What is the why that makes you fight for your marriage? What is the why that that, 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 that makes you go to work, go to school with a cheerful, joyful attitude? What is that why? Ephesians 6, Paul gives us a good why if you don't have one. Verse 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Here we go. Slaves, obey your masters. Some may say bond servants, obey your masters with fear and trembling with a sincere heart, as you would Christ. Not by the way of our service as people pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man. Knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. Masters, Do the same to them and stop your threatening knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. Father, we pray this morning for the men and women in the room who are working a brand new job. They've just started. Maybe there's some in the room or worshiping with us online who they've been in the same job for 30 years or longer. Lord, some are out of work. They're unemployed. They're looking for work. Some are volunteering around different places in our city. Some are working hard as a stay-at-home mom. Some are in the corporate world. Some have their own small business. Some have their own practice. Some are working in government jobs. Some are working with a Christian boss or employer and some not. Some are working with Christian employees and some are not. We're all over the spectrum here. But God, your word is clear. Let us glean from it. Let it teach us. Let it shape us. Let let it mold us. Let us hear from you, Lord. Let us respond in Jesus' name. Let us thank you for the work you've given us. Let us be thankful for the job we can't stand. Let us be thankful for the job we love. Let us be thankful for every job in between. Work on our hearts today, Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name and all God's people said. Live every area of your life for the Lord. Do not compartmentalize your life and say, Sunday is when I'm holy. It's sacred. And I go to church that day. Monday through Saturday, maybe not so holy. No, don't compartmentalize. As a believer, every day is sacred. Every day is holy. 
as you follow Christ. So don't compartmentalize your life, but live every area of your life for the Lord. So here's six reminders right out of this text that I want to encourage you with today. Number one, you are obligated to obey. You are obligated to obey. Now notice verse 5. It reads, bond servants. My text says slaves. Obey your earthly masters. This word for obey is the same word you'll see in in, in verse 1. Children, obey your parents. It's this kind of thing. Yes, sir. It's a salute. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. You don't get to go to your employer and say, hey, can we talk about my job description? Want to rewrite it? Or It's not a plurality, right? You salute the rank, even if you don't salute the person. You don't respect your boss, respect the position. Obey your earthly masters. Uh, this is not a suggestion. It's a different word than it used for wives. Submit to your husbands. That's a willful submission. This is obey regardless, unless it's illegal or immoral, okay? Obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling. You're obligated to obey. Now look, I'm, I'm an expository preacher, and what does that mean? I pull the text, I pull the, the points of the text, I pull it out of the text. I don't take an idea and then go find a text. I let the text talk, okay? So with that being said, I mean... We're not going to punt on this word. We're not going to skip over this word. We're not going to pretend this word's not here. We're not going to pretend that slavery was not a, a, a real issue in our, our history, a problem, and an issue in Paul's day. And we're not going to punt over this. We're not going to work around it. We're not going to avoid it. We're going to hit it head on. In the Roman world, they had 60 million slaves. There were more slaves in the Roman world than there were freedmen and women. It was a part of their socio-economic culture of the day. Uh, In the Greco-Roman world, as one historian wrote, slavery was so much a part of life that hardly anyone thought about whether it might be illegitimate. They did not merely do menial work. They did nearly all the work, oversight, management, and most professions. Some slaves were more educated than the owners. Slaves were considered a part of the household. Slavery in Paul's day was not racially motivated. They were considered property. They had no right, sure, but they were a part of that household. I mean, look, Paul is writing this letter to slaves and masters are mentioned in the same section, so apparently they were in worship together. Both the slave and the master were both in worship together. Otherwise, Paul would not have written it this way, and he's writing it to them to understand how to live in that situation. Paul said, hey, if you can gain your freedom, gain it. But if you're in this situation and you're a slave under the authority of a master, here's how you're to behave. And if you're a master with authority over a slave, here's how you're to behave according to the gospel as a follower of Jesus. So why doesn't the Bible condemn slavery? Well, the gospel outright condemns slavery. There is no slaver free. They just attacked it from a different way. Paul attacked it from within, not from without. The the point of the Bible is not to overthrow Rome, though the gospel overthrew Rome. Amen? The point of the Bible is not to reform government or to reform the uh, societal constructs. The point of the Bible, what Paul is aiming at, is right here, the heart. He's aiming at the heart. If the hearts change, the behavior will change. You don't change the heart with behavior modification. You know this, parents, right? The heart must be changed. So Paul is aiming at the heart. The Bible targets the heart. Now slavery in our our history, American, European history, racially driven, sinful, wicked. No doubt about it. Wicked as it can be. In Paul's day, it was, sure, there were sinners involved in it. I'm sure there were sin. I'm sure there was abuses. I'm sure all that occurred, but it was part of that culture of the day. It more functioned like an employee-employer relationship in that a person could pay off their debt by selling themselves into slavery. I'll be your bond servant. I owe you. I'm going to pay off my debt by working for you for, for an amount of time. And when I've completed that time, I'll 
I'll be released from being your slave or bondservant. That was a very common thing. It was just a part of the economy of that day. Some, to avoid prison time, would sell themselves into a bond servant for a time. If I stole from you, I could come work it off instead of going to prison. That was just a part of their economy of the day. It was an avenue for people uh, during that day. But the gospel is the point. It says there is no slave, there is no free, we're all one in Christ. The ground is level at the cross. Amen? Racism is wicked and has no place in the life and heart of a believer. Amen? No place. It's straight out of the pit of hell. Our slavery and our history is straight out of the pit of hell. But Paul understood there's people living this in his day. He said, well, here's how you function if you're in this. You can gain your freedom, gain it. But if not, here's how we function. So we're going to apply this in an employer-employee type of situation. And here's what it says. Obey. We know this same word used as children. How do we to do that? With fear and trembling, as you would Christ. So it's not you're walking on eggshells, shaking in your boots because you're scared of the boss. No, that's not what this means. With fear and trembling to this one, the Christ, the Lord Jesus, our Savior, our God. Work. Do everything you do, Paul says, unto the Lord. Work heartily unto the Lord, not to man. Your work matters to Jesus, so it should matter to you because you're working for Jesus. So you're obligated to obey. And look at this. I, I, I like this word sincere. It comes from a Latin word that means without wax, a sincere heart. In ancient times, they didn't have portraits. They didn't, have, they didn't, they didn't do selfies, so they'd make statues of people and when they were working on it sometimes it'd be cracked or 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 it would be chipped and they'd take some wax and they'd repair it with wax and then you'd take that home and if it got hot and the wax melted you say oh I've been had I should have checked the reviews right and some of those merchants of that day would have a sign over their pottery because when they bought pottery they'd hold it up to the sun and see if they saw any cracks in it and so some merchants would have over all their pottery and stuff say, without, without wax. This is sincere. This is true. It's not cracked, no blemishes. This is how our work should be. It should be sincere, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ. Think about that. If Jesus himself in the flesh walked into this room today and said to us what he said to the Samaritan woman, please give me a drink. Every one of us would jump up, leap to our feet, race to the water fountain, fill up our Stanley cup and bring it back and give him a drink. Or you'd race out of here and find a water bottle to give him a drink. You'd you'd do anything you could do to get Jesus a drink of water. That, that is the attitude that we're to serve those that have been placed over us. At work tomorrow, you serve your boss like you're serving Jesus. As you would Christ, you're obligated to obey. You say, well, he doesn't deserve it, or she doesn't deserve it. Years ago, I I read about this in our American history. There was a a slave owner who owned a huge plantation. Many slaves working for him. And this was a very cruel master, a very unkind master, a very mean master. And this master had one slave that was a follower of Jesus that was so joyful, so cheerful, just kind to the master all the time, obeyed the master all the time, and did it with a smile on his face. And this master took note. He said, there's something different about that slave. He just stands out among the rest. There's something different about him. So one day the master got on his horse, rode out to the field, stopped where that one slave, that 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 kind, cheerful, joyful follower of Christ's slave was. He stopped right at him. He looked down at him and he said, I want what you have. And the slave said, well, you can have what I have, but you have to get off your horse, get down here in the mud, and work with me. Well, the, the master said, What? I'm the master. You're the slave. 
You belong in the mud, not me. And he rode off. The next morning, the same master got on the same horse, went to the same field, talked to the same slave. I want what you have. The slave said, you can have what I have. You just have to get off your horse. You got to get in the mud. You got to work with me. The master said, I won't do it. No way. He rode off. The next day, for the third time, this same master on the same horse went to the same field to talk to the same slave. He said, I'm not joking. I'm not messing around. I want what you have. The slave said, I told you. You, just, you can have what I have. You have, to, you have to get off your horse Get down in here in the mud and work with me. So the master said, I'll do it. I'll do it. He got off his horse and the slave stopped him. He said, you really don't have to do it. You just had to want to do it. And then he pointed him to Jesus. And he began to tell him about how God loved him. And he began to tell him how Christ died for him on the cross and he began to tell him that Jesus would forgive him of his sins. He began to tell him how he could have joy in his life. Don't miss the dots here. Connect the dots, church. We, we've been in Ephesians 5 and Ephesians 6, and we've looked at all these relationships between wives and husbands and parents and, and children and employees and employers. And don't, don't miss the, the, the dot, the connecting of, of the dots here. What, what is the, the greatest weapon a wife has to change the heart of her husband? It is submission. What, what is the greatest weapon that, that a child has to change his or her parent's heart? It's submission. And, and what is the greatest tool a parent has? Submission. What, what is the greatest tool an employee has to change the heart of an employer? Submission. You're obligated to obey. Live every area of your life for the Lord. Every area. Behave like you believe the Bible when you're in the boardroom or you're on the ball field. Every area of your life, you're obligated to obey. Second reminder that shows us where to live for the Lord in every area of our life. Number two is your job. It's not just a job. Well, pastor, it's just a job. No, it's not just a job. I was at the marriage retreat and talking to Edward. He was making my omelet. Edward said, well, I'm a retired military and I just do this because I, I wanted something to do. It's just a job. Nope. It's not just a job. Your job will never be just a job as a believer in Christ. In the 1990s, Horace Grant played for the Chicago Bulls, NBA champion, and he wore these goggles when he played because he, he was legally blind. And he ended up having corrective eye surgery. And this is what he said because he continued to wear the goggles even after he had the eye surgery. And here's what he said. I'm quoting Horace Grant. After a few years, I got LASIK surgery, but I kept wearing them without the prescription lens because I had grandparents and parents come up to me and, and thank me for wearing them. Their kids and grandkids would get made fun of by wearing protective eyewear playing sports. So I kept wearing them to help make it cool to wear goggles for the kids. Your job is not just a job. As a believer, it's never just a job. Well, Pastor, I don't have a job like Horace Grant. Well, none of us do, right? But whatever you do, it will never be just a job if you're in Christ. And here's how Paul says it, that we are to obey, verse number 6, go to verse 6 for me, not by way of eye service as people please. You don't just work when the boss is watching. We don't work just to avoid being punished by the boss or get a reward from our earthly master. We're not working ultimately just for the earthly master. We're not working to avoid punishment. We're not working to just gain some reward. We have a higher one that we're working for. For your job is not just a job, so don't just work when the, when the boss is watching or when you're being monitored. or You know, the Holy Spirit makes a great point here. All through Scripture, we learn that disobedience, what it is. 
Partial obedience is disobedience. Divided obedience is disobedience. Delayed obedience. Boys and girls, when you delay that obedience to your mom and dad, that is disobedience when you delay it. When they tell you to do something and they got to tell you two or three times, that is disobedience. Delayed obedience is disobedience. And here the text is teaching that pretend obedience is disobedience. Don't be one who pretends to obey, but obey. Don't just pretend like you're all in when the boss is watching and then you're not in reality. Don't waste your boss's time in idle conversation. Don't call in sick when you're healthy. Don't pad your break times. Don't drag your feet. Don't arrive late and leave early. Don't expect someone else to do your job. You know this. If I am going to do your job, I want your paycheck, right? So don't be that employee. Your job is not just a job, but you are working as what? As bond servants of who? Of Christ. Slaves of Christ. Doing the will of God from the what church? From the what? When Jesus taught his disciples to pray, your will be done in heaven or your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, here's what that means. When you pray that, when you ask the Lord for His will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, this is what you're praying. Father, may Your will be done in my heart as it is in heaven. Do the will of God from the heart. Right here. When you're working for whoever you're working for, know you're ultimately working for the Lord and your job is not just a job. You're working for one greater Now, we're all in different spheres of work. You may be in vocational ministry, you may not, but we're all ministers. If you're in Christ, we're all ministers. Whether you're plumbing or whether you're teaching or whether you're leading a corporation, whether you're working from home, whether you're stay-at-home mom or dad, whatever it is, In whatever area that is, it's not just a job. Even when you volunteer as a believer, it's not just a job. It's not just a gig. It's much more than that. Tomorrow morning, you need to understand what you can do tomorrow morning. You say, man, there's a, there's a, in New Orleans, there's a, a, uh, a, a, a waste management company, a garbage pickup company called River Parish Disposal. And their their, their motto is, our business stinks, but it's picking up. You may be in a job that stinks, but it ain't picking up. And you want the Lord to pick you up out of it and move you, because it stinks. Well, it may be, just may be, that the Lord is not changing your circumstances because He's trying to change you. See, joy is not, put me in a different set of circumstances, joy is Christ in you. Amen? Christ in you. So live every area of your life for the Lord. When you walk into your job, you may want to be transferred. God, transfer me out of this job. Transfer me out of this job. Transfer me out of this job. Tomorrow morning, you can walk into that job and you can transfer that from just being a job to you can transfer it to your working for Jesus without even transferring jobs. So work for Him. It's not just a job. Number three, here's the third one. You are responsible for your response. This is what you're responsible for, your response. In verse 7, it says that you're responsible for your response. Here's how Paul says it in verse 7. He says, rendering service with a good will, having the right attitude, with a good will, as to the Lord and not to man. So you're rendering service with a great attitude. And that attitude determines altitude. Gets you to think higher, think above, think about the things above. It's been said that 10% of life is what happens to you and 90% of life is how you respond. Now, the, those percentages may change, but... the But the point is clear. You are responsible for how you respond. When you open that Nature Valley granola bar and crumbs go everywhere, 
You can either be frustrated or you can be elated. That if you collect all the crumbs, you can make three more granola bars. Amen to that. Your response is what you're responsible for. And Paul says you are to render, so you're to serve with a good, godly attitude, not a begrudging spirit. Put your heart and your soul into your work because you're working for the Lord and not for man. Attitude determines all that. Have a Paul and Silas attitude. No, they're, they're in prison and, man, they start praising the Lord and the doors are blown off that place. Well, well they didn't have a prophet come and tell them, I know you're down in the dumps. I know you're locked down in this prison, but if you'll praise the Lord, he'll blow the doors off. No, they just praise the Lord because that's what they do. Regardless of where they are, where they're stuck, you might not be stuck. The Lord may be trying to change you. So have that Paul and Silas kind of attitude that you just worship. Listen, you can serve the Lord out of a sense of duty that says, well, I have to. You can serve the Lord out of a sense of discipline, I ought to. Or you can serve the Lord out of a sense of devotion and say, man, I get to. I want to. Remember, you are responsible for your response. Number three, I'm sorry, number four. This is in verse number eight and nine, kind of bleeds over into both. You, you answer to one audience. Remember this, you got one, ultimately one boss. Paul said to Timothy, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus. One, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus. One audience. I charge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus. One, I charge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus. Preach the word. You, 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 you're serving an audience of one. There's a lot, of, a lot of people here this morning that I get the privilege to preach in front of you. That's, I love that definition of expository preaching. Is me enjoying the Bible in front of you. I like that. But I have an audience of one, Jesus. You have an audience of one. You may have 20, 30, 40, 50 people under you in your work as an employer or as an employee. But you ultimately have one audience. You may have one boss, four bosses, ten bosses, but ultimately there's an audience of one. One. This whole section is based on this. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Wives, submit to your husband as unto the Lord. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Fathers, don't exasperate your children, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the what? The Lord. The one audience. It's saturated with this in this text. Slaves, obey your earthly masters. Uh, why? Because as to the Lord, you have one audience that you're answering to. So let's look at this one word in 8 and 9. I love this word. It's knowing. Somebody say knowing. It, it again falls in verse 9, but it's knowing that what? That whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord. What do you need to know as you, as you work, as you live every area of your life for the Lord? What do you need to know? Here's what you need to know, that every act you do, every sacrifice you make, every time you're obedient, every time you submit, every time you speak a good word, every time you serve somebody, every time you love on somebody, it never goes unnoticed. You know that no act you ever do, no good you ever do, will ever go unnoticed by your audience of one. Yeah, a pat on the back is great, man. A high five, a fist bump is wonderful. A pay raise is great. A job promotion is awesome. Those are good things. They make you feel really great. But if you're only motivated by those things, sometimes they don't come. Sometimes you work hard and you don't get a pat on the back and you don't get a fist bump and you don't get a raise and you don't get a promotion and what are you going to do in that situation? This is what you need to know. Know what? That whatever good anyone does, he will receive back from the Lord. One day the Lord will reward you. You understand and know that. And no act you've ever done in your life goes unnoticed. It just doesn't. So you work for an audience of one. Paul said it like this, to live is Christ and to die is what? And whatever you do, work heartily unto the who? Lord Michelangelo, when he's painting the Sistine Chapel, he laid on his back to paint that incredible 
ceiling work that he did, that art he did. And he's laying there and he's going through all the details and he's drawing out the details and he's drawing out the details. He's drawing out the details. It took him years. One of his buddies said, man, why are you paying attention to all those details? People that are, that, that are going to be walking through here and look up, they're not going to be able to tell those details. Why, why, are you, why are you so meticulous with all these details? They will never know. And he said, but I'll know. Right? The Lord knows. Now, our audience of one is not Michelangelo. Our audience of one is Jesus. And we receive back from him whatever good we do. So remember, your audience is an audience of one you serve him. Whether he's slave or free. Whether you're the boss, the employer, or the employee. Doesn't matter. You serve one audience. Number five. Kind of shifts here to the masters in verse 9. Masters, do the same to them. And stop your threatening. So here's a word for the boss, the employers. Do the same to them. Do the same to them. So this is number 5. You must give respect to get respect. Respect is not commanded. Respect is not demanded. It is earned. You give it in order to get it. What do I mean by, by this? The other day, Tanya was breaking down Amazon boxes in our garage and putting them in the recycle bin, right? She's breaking them down. And, and she's breaking down these Amazon boxes, having a funeral for them and putting them in the recycle bin. Three more Amazon boxes show up on the porch to pay their respects to these she's breaking down. It's just an endless string of Amazon boxes. Well, I don't mean pay your respects. What do I mean by this? Here, here's what I mean by this. To get respect, you give respect. What, what, is, what does that look like? The idea here is not to widen the distance between employer and employee, but to shorten it. Not to widen it, but to shorten it. And, 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 and it must be mutually respectful. You must show humility if you want it. You must treat them with integrity and respect and gentleness and humility in, in, in that place where you work, wherever it is. From, from the house to the, to the corporate office, in the church, in, in a government position, in your practice, in your small business. With integrity, respect, humility, lead them that way. As an employee works through Christ and works for Christ and works as Christ, so the, the boss, the leader, leads like Christ and leads through Christ and leads for Christ. So live every area of your life this way. Do the same to them. You must give respect to get respect. Do the same to them. Treat them like you would treat Christ. Do the same to them. Number six, here's the last one. This is again for the employer, the boss, the masters. Your role is to rule rightly. Your role is to rule rightly. Leadership is not a right to rule. Leadership is the responsibility to rule rightly. Okay? So as a leader, do the same to them, yes. Stop threatening, stop bullying, avoid using threats to motivate. If you don't do this, you're going to lose your job. If you don't do this, you're not going to get this promotion. You don't, you're not going to get this raise. Is, the, the idea here is to avoid, if we can go to verse 9, when it says stop your threatening, it's to avoid this cutthroat mentality. That you go out and get all the clients you can get. No matter how you get them, just go get them. No matter what kind of corners you have to cut or what kind of immoral behavior you have to just go get them. The point is get more clients, get more clients. A survival of the fittest kind of, kind of mentality is unbiblical. That's a Darwinian thought. It's not creation, it's evolution. Evolution says survival of the fittest, not creation. That's a Darwinian thought. That's an unbiblical, ungodly thought when you promote that in your leadership 
Can, can your employee say of you, if you're the boss, if you're the employee, can they say, man, my boss is a fair, faithful man? You know, one of the worst things you can say about me is, our pastor should act like a Christian. Or our pastor is supposed to be a Christian. Ouch. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that. Saying to the, to, to the boss, my, my boss is supposed to be a Christian. Ooh, ah. If you're a believer, you don't want to hear that. So live every area of your life for the Lord. And know there's no partiality. There's no partiality with Him. Isn't this good news, church? That the ground is level at the cross. Yeah, titles matter in business and titles matter because it's good communication. But the Lord don't care about titles. He, you, don't have no, you don't have an in with Him because you're the boss or the CEO. or the, You don't have an in with Him because of your social status. Absolutely not. There's no partiality with Him. There's no favoritism with Him. So, so here's, here, here's a couple of thoughts for, for the unbeliever. I want you to understand that Jesus is watching. You know what? Heard a little boy say to his dad, Dad, why is it that when, when you drive, everybody's an idiot? And when mom drives, they're not. If little kids are watching us, and boy, they're watching us, aren't they? If little kids are watching us, Jesus is watching us. He's watching us. And if you're an unbeliever here in the room or worshiping with us online, you need to know this. You need to know that Jesus is watching. He sees everything you do. He sees the worst you do and the best you do. And the best you do to Him is just filthy rags outside of Christ. And He knows that. Jesus knows you at your worst. He knows you the most. He knows you the best. And He loves you the most. And He loves you the best. So surrender your heart to Him. If you don't belong to Him, let Him know that, hey, I've heard this gospel, that, that we're to do this as unto the Lord, that we're to do this like Christ, love the church. Well, how did He love the church? Well, He, he demonstrated that love. That While we were enemies of God, Christ died for us. His love is a drawing love. Jesus said that no one can come to me as the Father who sent me draws him. His is a dying love. That he died in our place and was buried and raised from the dead. That whosoever believes in him shall have eternal life. So please, if you don't belong to him, today's your opportunity to put your trust in Christ and come to him today. For all the rest of us, believers in the room, believers at home, worshiping with us online, let me say this. You're, the folks in your neighborhood, the folks at, that you work with, they probably know that you confess to be a Christian. I hope they know that. They're not going to come here for the purpose of watching to see if you're living like a Christian here. They're not going to come watch you here. Well, they say they're a believer. I'm going to, I'm going to go to their church. I'm going to watch and see if they sing. I'm going to watch and see if they, 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 you know, all the things in their mind that think would make a believer. I'm going to watch and see if they pray. I'm going to watch and see if they, they give. I'm going to watch and see if they serve each other. I'm going to watch and see if they love each other. They're not going to come here and watch that. They're probably not going to come to your house when you're doing your quiet time and say, well, I'm going to see if he's, if he's really praying, if, if she's really in the Word. They're probably, not, they're probably not going to do that. But I tell you this, they're watching you at work. They're watching you like a hawk. I mean, they're watching you. They're going to see if what you say you are is really who you are. They're going to determine that in the workplace. That's where they're going to determine that. So understand, every day is sacred and every day is holy. So know your why. Know why you do what you do. Know why your faith can work at work. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. Let us know that when we get up tomorrow and we go to that job that stinks and we don't like it, let us know this. Let us know that we can walk into work tomorrow and we can transfer our jobs from being just a job to being a job where we serve Jesus. 
And we can transfer our bosses tomorrow without transferring jobs tomorrow. Let us do that as believers and let us know and understand that people are watching. They want to see if we really are who we say we are. So God, let us make sure that we're living every area of our life for you. God, I want to pray for those that are looking for work. They don't have jobs. They're, maybe they're unemployed. Maybe they're thinking about a transition that would be life-changing for their family. Maybe they're in a brand new job or been in a job a long time and maybe going through the motions and maybe they're retired and they just picked up this to it's just a job I pray you'll change our attitude and our mentality it's not just a job we're working for you Lord so give us that give us that attitude let us point people to you whether we're at home at work the ball field the boardroom wherever we are let us do it for you, Lord. Thank you for those who've come today to say, yes, I'm lost and I want to trust Christ as my Savior. Maybe that's a boy or a girl, a teenager, a mom or dad, a grandparent, a husband, a wife. I pray that they come to one of our pastors and say, man, I'm ready to trust Christ. I'm ready to give my life to Him. Or, man, I need to be baptized. I need to just, I need to make this decision and be baptized. Or, I want to join the church or whatever decision, Lord. This is a time for a response for your people May we hear from you and respond to you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, let's stand and worship, church.